Okay, uh, why don't we get started, everyone? Uh, this is Jim Hammerschmidt. Kristen, thank you for that introduction. I hope everyone is doing fine this afternoon and is comfortably situated in their in their home offices or or home workspaces, wherever you found an opportunity to to uh, plop down the laptop and spread out your work material. Um, I've seen all kinds of interesting home offices over Zoom and go to meetings these days. Uh, for me, it's, it's kind of neat and interesting um, and lends a little bit of personal touch to uh, to what you may see in the office. So uh, welcome, everyone. A few uh, quick housekeeping matters. The uh, You should have a uh, toolbar, a GoToMeeting toolbar, uh, somewhere on your screen. And there is a handout section. It indicates there's two handouts. You may uh, open that and download the handouts at that location. You also see a question bar. Um, and uh, that is, just like it says, it's for questions that you have for us. What would be great, what we'd really appreciate if you can, is to try to hold typing off at typing or at least sending those questions to, to, until closer to the end of the, um, of the webinar. Uh, when, they, when they build up over time, sometimes it's difficult to get to the, to the earlier questions. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, we may take some uh, uh, under consideration and get back to you by a separate email or something that later like that later. But uh, with uh, those housekeeping uh, issues, uh, everyone is muted, by the way. And um, please bear with us if there's any technical issues. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these webinars lately, and I think we've got everything pretty well smoothed out. But you never know when the technology god is going to strike and, uh, and create a difficulty. So we appreciate everyone's patience if that should happen. So with that, let's, let's get rolling. Um, Boy, it's uh, th these are these are extraordinarily interesting times. Obviously, for all of us, we are all experiencing uh, new frontiers as both employees and employers um, in the workplace. And what we're going to talk about this afternoon is a little bit of legal and a little bit of practical, a little bit of guess, a little bit of speculation, um, best practices, and we're going to talk about what this may look like as we begin to prepare to return to the workforce. Um, you know, our experience so far is that most of the clients, at least in the uh, DMV area, have not returned, but are certainly putting on the radar and considering. Now is a great time to do the intense and difficult, complex and um, and uh, 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 planning that is going to be required to return our workforces to the office, whether it's five employees or 500 employees. Uh, these issues are complex. We don't know all the answers. Uh, we're gonna have to be flexible, but now is definitely the time to start planning. Um, it was interesting, uh, you'll see the slide that's up right now. This came out of the Washington Post last Friday and really caught my attention. And it's that a majority of Americans going to work fear exposing their households to the coronavirus. And a survey of more than 8,000 adults, six in 10 Americans um, who are walking, working outside the home are concerned about their return to the workplace for fear that they're going to contract the virus and then bring it home. And uh, you know, as you know from listening to the nightly news and talk shows, the home environment is where the majority of spreading occurs uh, with the coronavirus. So it's certainly a real fear that someone picks it up and um, uh, someone fears that they're going to pick it up at the office and return home and spread it to their to their uh, their relatives, some of whom may be uh, at high risk, um, immunocompromised, et cetera. So. Uh, certainly, this is going to be a significant challenge for us as employers to uh, earn the confidence of our workforce, to communicate with them in a way that, that instills confidence and trust, to show them the steps that we're taking as employers to build confidence and trust, and probably being flexible with uh, many of these uh, uh, workers who are anxious about return to the workplace. 
So uh, let's go to the next slide, Kristen. Um, so what do you, what do we do? How do we prepare for success? Obviously, a lot of a lot of planning and preparing. Um, communicating to our workforce is going to be absolutely um, uh, critical. We don't want to keep our employees in the dark. Employees should understand what's going on to the maximum extent possible, and that information should be um, should be communicated to them. Uh, having written policies in place, um, even if they aren't required by state or local law, is going to be extremely important in distributing those out to your to your employees and facilitating that, that communication. Um, being being in a place where you can monitor what is going on in your workplace. Um, how are you going to set up monitoring for your own workforce, for visitors to the workforce? What are you going to do if there are positive uh, uh, tests in the workplace? What are you going to do if someone shows up with symptoms that could potentially be uh, COVID-19 related? How are you going to monitor those individuals coming into the workspace and what kind of contact tracing are you going to put in place to be able to um, respond to situations where you may have um, a virus that has entered your workplace or someone who uh, contracts the virus that has been in your workplace and, and, and last we're going to need to adopt um, adapt this is not going to be um, something where uh, uh, plans are put in place and they're written in stone. Uh, there's so much uncertainty about this virus, uh, how it spreads, um, uh, what are the quarantine periods, uh, what are the safe periods for return to work, what are exactly the symptoms, what did the test show if we are taking a test in our workplace, are they snapshots, how reliable can they be. There's all kinds of uncertainties that we're learning literally day by day and as uh, employers, we're going to need to be flexible and adapt as we go along. There's going to be policies and procedures that we're going to put in place that we find out aren't working like they're supposed to work. And we're need to, going to need to be um, in places where we can respond and change that to uh, continue to uh, follow best practices for, for a safe workplace. So, you know, what kind of guidance do we have to date from our local um, state or federal governments. Um, Kristen, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, as we know, last week the uh, the CDC came out with um, with uh, some uh, somewhat abbreviated guidance for returning the economy uh, to um, to a, a place where we can reopen businesses, shops, commercial, retail, et cetera. There was one particular um, uh, 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 flow chart that was provided for uh, workplaces and it's showing up on your screen there. I mean, certainly we were hoping uh, for a lot more guidance from the CDC and our, and our federal government. Uh, apparently there was a fairly detailed 60 some page um, document that was being prepared by the CDC to, to help us all move forward. Uh, the administration was not happy with that, so the CDC came out with something that's obviously more abbreviated. But if you look at it, it does, it does provide the big picture. And it's now up to us as employers to dial in on each of these check marks or boxes that the CDC has provided us and really get behind that to put into place the systems, policies, and protocols that facilitate um, uh, opening our workforce back up. So with that, uh, let's start, let's talk about um, the whole idea of when is a good time to begin to bring uh, employees back into the workforce. All right, so I'm gonna take it for this slide Kristen, if you could swap, thank you. Um, this is Jessica Summers. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of start by running through some of the critical planning questions that we are seeing and recommending that businesses really ask themselves as they're looking ahead to, as Jim said, really take the time, plan for reopening, think through the scenarios before you're actually facing them. 
Um, obviously, probably the biggest one that we're all dealing with is when do we start bringing employees back into the workplace? Um, here in the DMV, we have a bit of a patchwork going on between um, state, local um, rules and regulations as far as coming back to work, put into play the district, and if you have multi-jurisdictional offices, um, that can really be a bit of a headache. So it's going to be obviously first and foremost a matter of the business determining where it fits as far as the essential and non-essential classifications. Hopefully that's already been done at some point in the past when things are being closed. Um, and then monitoring the state and local guidance for um, reopening and when the business can bring employees back to the workforce. Uh, but as Jim mentioned, we're seeing a, a lot of data coming out that just because businesses are allowed to come back and start opening up doesn't necessarily mean that employees want to some, start coming back into the workplace and will be willing to come back into the workplace. And for many businesses that have the opportunity and ability to allow employees to um, telework, whether all the employees or some employees, um, it certainly may be um, useful or worth considering um, seeing how the reopening goes for um, other businesses that are not able to function with employees remotely um, to see how things go and, and take examples and lessons before moving towards reopening. Um, so a few things obviously to consider beyond state and local guidance. Um, as I mentioned, capacity of some or all of your employees to work remotely. Um, if you don't need to have all employees in the office, can you bring some groups back? Um, can you bring some departments back so that you're not having uh, suddenly an inundation of all your employees returning to work at the same time? Um, that also ties into the idea of the physical limitations of the workplace. So thinking through whether you're able to bring all or some of your employees back while still maintaining social distancing and the appropriate guidelines. Um, thinking about the availability of employees, we've seen a number of employees starting to take leave because they have kids at home, because they have elderly parents who've been taken out of nursing homes at home. Um, so actually thinking through which employees are actually going to be available to physically come back into the workplace. Um, again, tying into the idea of can we bring some or all employees back um, in a more phased opportunity, so not necessarily bringing everyone back on day one, but looking into phasing different groups of necessary employees back um, in increments so that it can be more slowly and planned out. And as Jim said, we can adapt based on how things are going. Um, I would flag that OSHA has issued some guidance. Um, guidance 3990 is the most recent, um, really dealing with the idea of the risk environments at work. Um, for those businesses that are in the high risk work environments, so the health practitioners, uh, medical providers, people who are directly having hand-to-hand -hand physical contact with other individuals, as a matter of their job requirements, um, those are going to have higher thresholds and higher obligations when it comes to OSHA as far as trying to protect against risk for employees. Uh, for your lower to medium risk jobs, um, really the idea and the focus that OSHA has made clear is that they're going to be really looking to see um, to the extent that there are complaints or concerns raised, whether a business has really taken the appropriate steps that they can to eliminate what risk they can. So that's part of what we're going to be talking through today is what risks can we identify and what risks can we try to address before they become an issue. Um, I would note as far as we're talking about OSHA, um, just yesterday AFL-CIO actually filed a lawsuit against OSHA trying to require them to adopt uh, emergency short-term standard and more rigorous guidance um, for COVID-19 for employees in the workplace. So that's something we'll also be uh, monitoring and something to keep on the radar that there could be more coming out of OSHA. So turning it back to Jim for the next slide. Right, so as Jesse touched on, uh, there are a number of ways to consider how you bring uh, the, the workers back into the workfloor, workplace. You know, like I said, we've learned probably a lot about ourselves and how we conduct business as employers. And um, there's certainly over the years and in many discussions we've had with our clients as well as discussions that I've had with other uh, employment law attorneys, tele telecommuting has not been, um, you know, obviously universally accepted. There is a wide spectrum of uh, comfort level with various companies and employers on Tele telecommuting, but I think we've we've over the last two months have all learned a lot about that, 
and how we feel about it, um, which is going to play into the idea of how we bring workers back into the workforce. There are really an infinite number of ways to do it, um, a million ways to consider it, and uh, the, some of them are listed on the screen here. You know, bringing them back en masse, it's certainly an option, certainly not the best practice, not recommended by any expert that I've heard talk about this. Uh, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you could stagger by, you know, departments or shifts. You can look at essential versus non-essential workers. Um, you can consider workers that may feel that they need to be in the office to be more productive versus those that feel and have shown their ability to be entirely productive uh, in a home office. Uh, you can consider by job duties or responsibilities. Maybe by the different services you offer as a company, maybe different locations, certainly. There are different parts of the country, obviously, as we all know, that have been impacted by, um, by coronavirus and uh, much differently than other locations. So maybe it makes sense to bring uh, some, some workers back in more remote or rural locations where um, the coronavirus does not appear to be as prevalent. Maybe you do it by office size. Uh, those offices where you have more space, more ability to physical, physically distance employees, you can figure out how that's working before you move to uh, offices that uh, are maybe more, more cramped. Uh, there's also, um, if, if anyone's heard about, heard about this, uh, this four in 10 scenario, which was developed by researchers uh, in Israel, along with the uh, London School of Economics, the idea here is that um, you start off with a four-day uh, in-office work week, followed by a 10-day a uh, remote uh, teleworking scenario for each employee. And the, the reason is, is basically that it takes an average of three days before um, an employee can infect, infect someone else if they've become infected. So that means that people can theoretically work or attend school together for a short time um, if they then spend another stretch of time on lockdown. So the four days of work followed by 10 days at home. Uh, if someone's gotten sick during the time at work, uh, theoretically they'll show up during their 10 days off and they won't come back for their next four day shift. So that's sort of the idea behind the four and 10. Again, um, I think in some part we're shooting in the dark here, but it is an idea. It's a way to consider it. Um, and if you do that and use some other method of staggering, um, you know, you may, you may be able to create that, that physical distancing and, and limit the spread. Um, I think it's a good idea to talk to other uh, other companies in your particular industry or uh, even in your office building uh, to see how they may be bringing their workforces back and to compare notes. So, for example, um, as some of you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not only a, a, an employment law attorney, but I'm co-managing partner of, of Paley Rothman. And for the last uh, eight weeks, I jump on a weekly call with the managing partners uh, at other comparable firms in Montgomery County and we talk about things like this and we talk about the various challenges that we all face in the legal industry both dealing with our our um, co co-workers who are the attorneys as well as our our staff members and it's been a fascinating and wonderful sounding board to see how uh, uh, comparable sister uh, uh, firms are considering doing this and the lessons that they've learned so all kinds of ways to cut this. The, the only real legal issue that, um, that, that really lurks out there um, is, uh, you know, possibly the idea that, that by having a neutral policy or practice of bringing certain employees back and not others, that maybe it's that that neutral policy is actually having a disparate impact and therefore a discriminatory. Uh, against certain other parts of, parts of the workforce. So you want to at least have an eye on that. Um, I don't think that by and large, uh, most of our clients need to engage in any kind of sophisticated disparate impact analysis to see if their policies and procedures for bringing workers back into the workforce 
are having an adverse impact, um, but certainly it's something just to, to keep your eye on and have in back of your mind. Um, later on, we're going to talk about accommodations and some of those things for workers that don't want to come back. But but that's the real that's only the real legal issue, and I think it's 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 a remote issue. Um, at the end of the day, you have a lot of flexibility as an employer to try to figure out how you want to do this. Jess? Let's turn to the next slide, Kristen. Uh, so testing has been obviously one of the big conversations, testing employee verifications, information collection before you have employees come into the workplace. Um, that certainly raised a number, a number of questions. Um, obviously, with respect to the COVID-19 testing, um, a lot of the considerations are limited by the fact that the testing may not be widely available for most of your employees. So when we're talking about testing, we really sort of can break it down into sort of three categories as the EEOC has done. Um, first, temperature taking, so checking someone's temperature to identify whether they have an elevated temperature, uh, which is one of the key symptoms of COVID-19 the actual COVID-19 test um, and antibody testing. Um, now, the EEOC has issued guidance that has confirmed that employers can require employees to submit to temperature testing and COVID-19 testing. The idea there being that while typically the ADA does not permit employers to require employees to submit to medical testing, um, the idea here is that there's sufficient hazard posed by COVID-19 that employers, in order to protect uh, other employees as a business necessity, can require employees to submit to these tests. What's a bit more of a gray area, both from the science perspective and the legal perspective, is the antibody testing, which is the testing that identifies whether an individual has, has developed the antibodies, most likely from exposure to having COVID-19, whether they actually express symptoms or not. Um, First of all, there's a whole host of issues going on with FDA approval um, and whether or not these tests can be um, validly administered. The additional concern is that the EEOC really has not weighed in on antibody testing yet, um, presumably because it is still so new and uncertain as far as the, the actual science behind it, um, largely because really the antibody testing is not testing for whether someone poses a risk to other people because they are carrying active COVID-19, but rather whether they may, um, again, depending on what science ends up showing, be more resistant to developing COVID-19 again in the future because they've already had it. Um, so when talking about temperature testing, going back a bit, you know, there's a few different ways that businesses can take advantage of this. Um, first, we've seen some clients talking about doing temperature testing from home. So they are buying thermometers for their employees sending them out and asking each employee to check their temperature in the morning um, and confirm that it is not elevated before they come to work. Um, obviously, some of this will be a matter of, you know, employee certifying, um, self-certifying that they've actually done this and remembering to do this, um, but that does help cut down on some of the logistical issues that you might face if you're doing temperature testing in the workplace. Um, with temperature testing in the workplace, there's a number of things to think about. Um, First of all, just the logistics. Who is going to actually do the temperature testing? Um, are they going to have sufficient PPE? How are you going to have employees safely line up and congregate for the temperature testing? Um, how are you going to try to um, shield employee information when you're doing the temperature testing so you don't have someone coming up to the front of the line having a, a temperature and being turned away in front of all their coworkers? Um, so there's a lot of logistics to think about if you are looking at temperature testing um, in the workplace, perhaps looking at um, phased entry for each employee having a different entry time, um, one person designated to do the temperature testing. Um, and obviously, if you are doing temperature testing, whether from home um, or in the workplace, you want to have clear guidelines as to when employees are going to get sent home um, and who is going to make those calls if something is borderline. Um, Self-evaluation, that's really going to come down to the employee self-reporting, which we're going to get to um, in, in just a few minutes, but um, really looking at employees um, providing medical information in any way, whether it is submitting to COVID-19 tests, submitting to temperature tests, um, submitting any kind of information about their medical past or history is going to trigger 
um, obligations by the employer to really be careful about the way this medical information is treated. Um, for those of you who have worked on handbooks with me, I'm sure you probably heard me remind you that medical information cannot be stored in an employee's personnel file. So it's really important to remember that if you have an employee who gets a COVID-19 test or generate any medical information related to employees as we go through this return to work process and this public health crisis, you want to make 100% sure that any of that medical information is being safeguarded and protected away from the employee's personnel file. Um, that's by federal law, and the intention there is to make sure that medical information is being limited to a need-to-know basis, um, with the idea being that, you know, for example, while a manager may need access to an employee's personnel file to see what their past reviews have been like, compensation decisions, um, there's largely going to be no reason that a manager um, needs to know an employee's COVID-19 status or what their temperature was on a certain day. So making sure you're protecting that information well. Um, and then thinking about and developing uh, return to work guidelines. If you've had employees who have either been sent home because um, they have had an elevated temperature or have been asked to stay home because they're exhibiting signs of COVID-19 or have been exposed, um, confirming what types of fitness for duty certifications you're going to need. Um, obviously, you want to do that with a mind for um, paying attention to what employees are actually validly going to be able to get. So, you know, most employees who have not been sent for a COVID-19 test are going to be able to get a letter from their doctor saying they're free and clear to return to work um, if it's not been a 14-day waiting period. Um, also looking at what the CDC guidelines and local health authorities have said, um, as far as the requirements for when somebody can come back after having a potential exposure is certainly going to be important. So turning it back to you, Jim. So um, if you can go back to the last slide for a second, reiterate uh, something Jesse said. I mean, my, my own view is that doing in-house testing is just fraught with all kinds of logistical uh, nightmares and potential legal issues. Um, I think for most workforces, um, particularly uh, to particularly our clients and, and the size of workforces that, that we're working with, self-monitoring is probably the most useful tool um, and it avoids many of the traps and legal issues that Jesse articulated. Uh, before the, uh, the, the seminar or webinar began, we also had a question from a client about um, uh, what if someone uh, goes to a central, central testing point, um, they, are, they receive a phone call that they've tested positive, but the testing station is not willing to give out um, anything in writing. Uh, what can the employer do vis-a-vis -vis, um, granting that employee paid sick leave under the federal paid sick leave law and then getting the payroll tax retention credit for those 80 hours of leave. Um, my advice, I think that the best that we can say at this point is what I would ask the employee to do is to send either text or email indicating uh, when they'd gone to get the test that they'd received a call that the, uh, that the test was positive and that they're unable to get a certificate or, um, or anything else from the testing facility in writing and keep that email or text message as your documentation um, should, you know, God forbid the IRS ever audit the, um, the payroll tax retention credit you're taking for that situation. So just wanted to, um, to throw that out there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> right, um, so, so talking about uh, physical, um, or, or well, I'm sorry, talking about communications. Uh, obviously, the communications are uh, are are the are the crux, the key to making this work smoothly. You should probably already be communicating with your employees even before they are uh, getting notice that there's going to be a reopening in the office. Letting employees know what you're doing in terms of um, planning and uh, working for toward that return date when it comes up. Uh, you don't have to get a full-blown plan out right now. You don't have to have all the questions answered right now, 
but you should be letting the employees know that you're focused on the issues, that you're reviewing state and local guidelines, that you're reviewing state and local orders, that you've you know, scoured the CDC and OSHA websites, and that you are gonna come up with a plan that keeps them safe, keeps them healthy, and is right for your workforce. Um, so be clear about, communicate your health plan and explain your rationale. Um, I think it's important to probably prepare uh, what I would call return to work notices. You may have a variety of different buckets that employees are in right now. Maybe some are furloughed, maybe some have gone from full-time to part-time, um, maybe uh, you've, you've laid off some workers that you're gonna be bringing back, maybe some employees have uh, employment contracts, uh, maybe some positions employees are not going to return to, so you're going to need to do new hires. Um, I don't think there's going to be a, a specifically one-size-fits-all notice, but you're probably going to want to come up with three or four different notices that address the circumstances for each particular uh, bucket of employees. Um, certainly, what you say to a furloughed employee who's not officially been laid off is going to be different from a worker who's laid off, who you're going to need to essentially rehire and, uh, and, 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 and obtain all the, you know, the onboarding materials and, and uh, I-9s and all that from the employee as you re rehire the employee into the workforce. So, um, but those, the content of the notices, I think, is very, very important. Um, it's going to set expectations for the employee, and it's going to be a method for you to communicate to the workforce, um, whether there's any changes in the terms of, terms of employment, are people gonna be coming back part-time? Are they gonna be coming back three-quarter time? Uh, what's the phasing gonna look like? Are they gonna be in the office some days and not others? Are they gonna continue to, to, telecommuni to, to telecommute? Um, is there gonna be any cha change in their compensation when they return? Uh, workers who are on commissions, are they gonna come back to the same commission schedule if they've been, if they've taken any time off? Is there going to be any reductions in pay? These are all really important things to communicate uh, to your workforce. Um, what are they going to be expected to wear in the way of PPE? What if they can't wear PPE or they refuse to wear PPE? What are you going to communicate to them about those particular situations? What new policies and, and mandates um, are you going to have in the work in the workforce? You need to remind employees that while this is a return to work scenario, if um, if uh, they're engaging in self monitoring and they come down with with symptoms, uh, COVID related or flu like symptoms, they need to stay home and they need to go back to the quarantine protocol. So all of these things are very very important. They should probably be developed and communicated in a return to work notice. And like any other notice to, um, <clears throat> to your workforce of this nature, it's always good to put the catch-all uh, language that us lawyers like to have that uh, no matter what it says, everyone's still uh, an at-will employee. So uh, this is, I think, one of the critical pieces of communication to your workforce as you begin to bring people back into the workplace. The next slide, Kristen. So as we've all been becoming uh, epidemiologists and lawyers and doctors in our spare time, um, so too have we become structural planners. Um, just to flag here a few things of, that we've collected as far as um, thoughts and considerations for actually modifying the physical structure and maintenance of the workplace. Um, so thinking that through that not only are you going to be controlling and considering the people that you're bringing back into the workplace, but the workplace itself. Um, we've seen the research that virus really virus lives depending on the surface really between 42 and 72 hours depending on the material. Um, so trying to make sure you're creating a physical structure that is going to be as safe as possible for employees. Um, obviously trying to de-densify to create social distancing even if it is not a mandate um, where you are as far as six feet. Um, thinking about whether you can either clear up vacant space to uh, move employees who might be sitting in close proximity to one another so they can be spread out better. Um, as Jim mentioned, the idea of, you know, perhaps bringing back people who have larger offices and more space first. Um, talking to your building managers or whomever you are engaging to handle the cleaning of the office, 
Um, you know, perhaps your office was only cleaned once a week, um, especially if, as we we're going to discuss in a moment, um, you're talking about employees coming in and alternating shifts, for example, where, you know, someone's coming in on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and another group's coming in on Thursday or on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, you know, you certainly want to make sure that you are cleaning between the different phases and different groups of employees who are coming in. Um, and even if you don't have different shifts of employees coming in, um, just increasing the cleaning and intensiveness to cleanliness within the workplace is certainly going to be critical. Um, creating employee zones. Um, you know, I've been taking our own office as the example I've been using. Um, we have the sixth and seventh floor of our lovely building that we hope to see one day again um, down on Bethesda Row. I work on the seventh floor. Um, on the right side of the seventh floor, there is a restroom near my office. There is absolutely no reason why I should be meandering down to the sixth floor or to the other side of the seventh floor unless um, I have a specific purpose. So there's going to probably be a lot of people who really are needing that social contact and the um, tendency to feel like you want to wander this new space you haven't been in for so long. Um, but making it clear to different employees that, you know, if your office, restroom, and everything you need is in a certain area of the office, that the full office may not be fully accessible and open to you. Um, thinking about doing one-way stairs or hallways. Um, so, you know, so everybody's not passing close by one another. Um, obviously, with the stairways, if you're in a larger building, um, that may take some coordination um, with the building management or the other folks in the build, sharing the building with you. Um, similarly, thinking about elevator limits and how you're going to use the elevators. Um, if you're in a larger building, obviously, we all sort of think of those downtown DC buildings in particular that you get there at nine o'clock in the morning for a meeting and the doors open up and there's 20 people packed up tight into an elevator all trying to get up to the same place and you know you're waiting five minutes for that elevator as it is so thinking about you know planning with other people who are using the space even if it's not within your office um, to determine whether you can try to either set limits for the number of people on elevators phase the starts of the workday so that not everybody's showing up at the same time and trying to get up the floors at the same time um, will certainly be something to consider. Um, also talking about the idea of limiting communal spaces. Um, so we all love our you know, kitchen, conference rooms, break rooms, um, but those tend to be the places where A, people are touching lots of things that other people are touching, um, and B, where people tend to be in closer proximity to one another. So either closing those spaces off altogether, um, perhaps you're actually going to need those spaces to make makeshift offices for people who are not able to space out in their normal um, workspaces, um, or at very least setting limits so that you can actually sit in a conference room and see how many people can we actually fit safely in this conference room with everybody being six feet apart and placing limits um, on how many people are permitted within those rooms. Uh, and then also thinking about the ingress and egress, as I mentioned, the elevator, but also thinking about the doors. Um, you know, are people going to be have to grabbing the doors in and out of the building? Um, is there a way to easily install um, the kick opener we've been seeing or provide employees with some type of grip that they can use so that they aren't actually touching their hand to the door uh, to pull it open? So just thinking about these physical options and you know, really almost as a matter of HR or the professional, just be taking a, either in your mind or physically doing it, taking a run through of being the employee who's walking into your workspace um, and seeing what it is that you would naturally be touching, naturally be passing through, coming in contact with, and thinking about ways that we can make that safer. Back to you, Jim. Yeah, and, to, and, and to, to build on that, Jesse, and going uh, engage um, your property manager or your building manager. If uh, if you have one in your building, they can be very useful source for considering and coming up with um, physical structures or or uh, physical things that you need to enhance the safety and health of your space. Uh, I know we engaged our uh, property manager in our building and um, they were able to one of their maintenance workers was a actually able to build for us a very nice glass partition 
that is going to sit on, on both sides of the um, reception desk in our lobby. It was very classy, very well done. It works beautifully in our space. And they were able to develop it right on site and, uh, and, and, and develop something that was customized for our, um, our reception area to keep, our, to keep those, um, those droplets that someone may bring into the space from going into the, uh, into the reception desk area. So, you know, work with the resources you have um, and, uh, and, and lean on your, your property manager, your building manager to assist you. So looking at the, the next slide, probably don't need to spend much time here. I mean, I think we're all pretty familiar with the various types of uh, personal protective equipment that is out there. We see it on the news nightly. Um, certainly masks or face coverings are probably going to be required, likely, by, uh, by our local authorities, state or state authorities. Um, so, you know, uh, again, going back to the notice that you're going to send out to your employees, are you going to have masks available for anyone? Are you going to be able to find sufficient quantity? Are you going to make your employees provide their own mask? And if so, what type of mask are you going to require? Is it going to be an N95 or better? Can it be a cloth mask? Can it be a homemade mask? Or are you going to require something more manufactured? Um, and again, this is where you can both... Uh, get creative and maybe turn in turn uh you know a lemon into a lemonade we at paley rothman are actually looking at uh, at logo styled masks so we will have masks available for our workforce that carry a paley rothman logo um uh and we will have them available uh for our workforce and for our for our guests and visitors so uh again uh this 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 can this is obviously going to uh, impact uh, the way we go about doing our business and it's a, a new normal but there are all kinds of interesting ways to maybe um, to leverage it and, uh, and, 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 and you know maybe create a little bit of a little bit of fun with it too. Uh, gloves are a you know a, a much debated issue is that anything different than your hands uh, it just spreads the virus on a glove instead of by skin. Uh, do gloves discourage individuals from washing their hands as much as they should be washing their hands? Um, so that one, again, will, will be a matter of, of personal preference. Um, for example, I know I like wearing a glove just because it reminds me not to touch my face. And I can put frequent hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer on gloves that, you know, I might do it uh, a couple times an hour putting on gloves, but doing that a couple times an hour on your hands is going to have, you know, an effect. So, so gloves are, are a bit more of a personal preference and uh, there's certainly debate either way. Trying to make sure you have these products, you should be accumulating them now, obviously, to the extent that you can do so. There's all kinds of um, uh, uh, manufacturers out there that have turned their, their normal product manufacturing into manufacturing of of PPE, whether it's a, you know, a microbrewery starting to produce hand sanitizer with alcohol or, or whatever it is. So things are becoming, I think that log jam is beginning to break, but certainly should be acquiring um, all of that material now. Have signs up about what to expect with visitors. Get information to those workers in your workforce that are in contact with scheduling uh, visitors or customers to come coming to the workplace if you're going to allow that to happen. Let your customers and vendors and visitors know what they can expect and what the requirements are going to be for them when they come into your workforce uh, or your workplace. Are they going to be required to wear masks? It's probably a very, very good idea. Uh, what else are they going to be required to have, if anything? Where will they be meeting? Maybe the conference rooms are going to be different, letting them know that you're going to have large conference rooms available so that they understand when they come into your workplace that there are going to be physical distancing requirements, et cetera. So thinking through all of these issues um, in the context of your particular work, workplace and your workforce are going to be important.
and actually, I would add that in building on that, um, we actually had one of our clients was working through this because they are an essential business that is, is reopening slowly right now. Um, and one suggestion they made that I thought was great was they were purchasing two masks per employee because they're going to be using um, cloth masks for certain employees, and they are setting specific um, requirements for how often the employees have to be laundering those cloth masks. So to the extent that you are um, allowing employees to wear their cloth masks, um, making sure that those are kept clean. Um, so speaking of PPE, um, what about employees who might refuse to wear PPE that you are requiring? Um, first and foremost, obviously, you want to find out why the employee is objecting. Um, we're going to get into this a little bit more detail in just a moment, but obviously there is an Americans with Disabilities Act, um, state and local law that are similarly tracked. Um, that may trigger issues. So if it is because the employee has some type of disability that makes it difficult for them to breathe in a mask or that they are allergic to latex in gloves, um, certainly uh, that would be, be something to consider. And as we'll flag, again, um, remembering that mental disability and physical disability are both protected by the ADA. So, you know, if someone has an anxiety disorder and perhaps the mask exacerbates that, um, really talking through whether there is an accommodation for that that employee, whether it is that they are not one of the employees that is brought back into the workplace, um, or whether it is working with their um, doctor to identify what type of PPE may be safe and appropriate for them. Um, if it's not an ADA issue, um, really looking and thinking through um, what other options are there for the employee who simply is refusing to um, to wear the um, wear the PPE for no protected reason, um, but simply based on, on a personal objection or personal discomfort. Um, obviously, the idea of leave or keeping them in the, in the home, placing them on furlough um, or termination. I mean, there's, this is an employer policy and we are going to be seeing, um, we're going to be recommending really that when you're creating these policies, you want to make sure employees understand that these are policies of the same import um, and same seriousness of the other policies you have in your handbook, whether it's the drugs and alcohol in the workplace, workplace safety, workplace violence policies. This is another type of safety policy that we're going to be putting into place. And employees who do not want to follow that policy um, and are not entitled to a reasonable accommodation or some other special um, dispensation because of a special unique situation um, really are going to have to be held accountable for their refusal to follow the policies. And as Jim mentioned, uh, before we turn off, as Jim mentioned, um, again, trying to figure out how you're going to communicate as far as customers and vendors and visitors to the workplace. Um, obviously, you want to make sure it's clear to people whether you will be excluding visitors who show up without a mask, for example, um, or excluding people who are not willing to wear a mask obviously, but being prepared to make exceptions to the extent that someone is not physically able or uh, mentally able to wear a mask and has an ADA accommodation right um, to be able to access that area. Right. And Jesse, on, on uh, looking at this slide, I also mentioned that I think it's, I think it's um, really worth the mental gymnastics to consider whether or not um, or, or what you can do, even though you may have uh, work more workers in the workplace or, or have brought back uh, some or a majority of the workers into the workplace, is it still necessary to have as much physical contact um, now as we did in the future when trying to dialogue with colleagues? So, for example, is it necessary for me to go uh, get up out of my chair and go into uh, Jesse's office to have a discussion with her about a, a case or a matter? Um, should we be encouraging and putting in policies and having frequent reminders sent to our workforce that at least for the time being, even though you may be in the office and even though a colleague may be in the office, uh, use the phone, use teleconference. Um, you know, if your workforce is a workforce that uses some kind of instant uh, messaging app for the office, uh, Slack or Microsoft Teams or Troop Messenger or Redbooth or any of those kinds of applications, 
Uh, maybe that's the best way for people to communicate, even though they may be down the hall from each other. And if you don't have those apps, maybe you should consider getting those apps. Um, can you get video cameras to put on, on um, everybody's uh, 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 computers if they aren't already built into the monitors? I know they're hard to come by right now. They're not tremendously expensive. And maybe if people really need that, that face to face, they need to be able to read um, nonverbal cues when talking with uh, other uh, coworkers, and maybe purchasing uh, cameras to, to put on everybody's, uh, everybody's um, uh, screen so that you, know, you can uh, easily talk with a, an office mate uh, quote face to face, even though you may not be in the same physical space. So again, rethinking a little bit about how we communicate with each other, even when we're all back in the space, is going to be very important. Yes, I take the next one. Yes. Yeah, so addressing potential risk areas. This ties in a bit to. Um, what I was talking about earlier, or ties in pretty significantly to what I was talking about earlier with employee testing, um, it's really going to tie equally into what you're asking employees to tell you and how you're going to be flagging risk before or in addition to um, any type of temperature test, other testing you're going to submit, require employees to submit to, um, making sure that employees and visitors understand what information is required of them. Um, so employees, making sure that you have employees who know whether you want to know if the family member, and the answer should be yes, if a family member is expressing symptoms of COVID-19 or family member has been exposed to COVID-19, um, make sure the rights are clear to the employee that they're going to have protected time to be out if they need to self-quarantine and that you're really encouraging employees to, um, in a sense, over report out of an abundance of caution and let the business be the one to make the determination. Um, we had one client that had an employee who was um, an essential worker, so they were still in the workplace, and they rightfully notified the business that their, their roommate had been sent for COVID-19 testing because the roommate's coworker um, had tested positive for COVID-19. That's exactly the type of communication you want to encourage and facilitate of your employees um, in this case, they let the young man stay home um, for a couple of days until the roommate's COVID-19 test came back clear. Um, so he understood that even though it was not him who was directly in contact with the person who had COVID-19 symptoms or had been diagnosed with COVID-19, the fact that he had been potentially exposed was something to communicate to his employer and something that his employer would accommodate and work with him on. So making sure employees really understand what constitutes exposure, um, and potential risk and really understand um, that they will be encouraged and they will be um, treated well if they do um, report something properly um, that they won't be seeing, you know, their, their precious leave time kicked down if they need to be out for a few days, ideally. Um, again, so that's what, with the self-reporting self parameters. Um, similarly, whether you're going to have any type of self-reporting required of visitors. So, are visitors going to have to undergo a questionnaire or a screening before they're permitted to come into the workplace? Um, all of this you want to be trying to encourage to occur before someone actually shows up to your workspace. So, you know, whether it is having someone who scheduled the meeting with the client, give them a call the day before to confirm that they are not having any symptoms of COVID-19 um, or have not had an exposure to COVID-19, that's going to be something to think through. Um, and then also sort of the takeaway communications to people who are not employees, but who are visiting your workspace. Um, are you going to be asking visitors or patients or clients um, to come back to you and let you know if within the 14 days they have been in your workplace, um, they have been tested positive for COVID-19 so that you can help with the contact tracing there. So just making it clear to anyone who's walking in your doors before they walk in your doors, what is going to be expected of them as far as trying to address potential risk areas. Right. And, and, and you can take the temperature of, of a visitor, you just have to think it's a good idea to let them know in advance that that's what they're going to be expecting. Um, so, you know, how will you respond if an employee tests positive, is exhibiting symptoms, or has been exposed? 
to COVID-19. Obviously, if there's an exposure, again, again, these plans should be in place well in advance. Um, if there's an exposure, I, I, I go to the four W's. That is, you know, what are you going to do with the worker? What are you going to do with your workforce? What are you going to do in your workspace? And who else are you going to are you going to notify? Um, so if, if, if someone uh, tests positive is exhibiting symptoms, um, obviously they're, they're going home. If they're in the workforce you should, or if they're in the workplace when it happens, you need to have a designated place thought of in advance where that employee is going to be quarantined until uh, uh, they can get out of the work the workspace um, and, and go home. Uh, you're going to put them on leave. Uh, you're going to have to do your contact tracing, obviously. Um, as Jesse alluded to earlier, there are there are some privacy issues. So um, uh, any medical information that is uh, that is communicated about the employee um, and their symptoms or their um, their their positive test needs to be uh, kept confidential. Uh, if you get any documents, they need to be segregated and kept in a separate file. Um, and you know, we we in our own workplace did have someone test positive. This was very early on. The employee was very very cooperative. Uh, said that we could let other people know. So we sort of had the green light um, to let everyone know, so they could in on their own determine what level of contact they had with that particular employee. That's not always going to be the case. And obviously, if someone tests positive. Um, uh, confidential that prevents you from from uh, disclosing uh, that individual's name. So you're going to have to do the contact tracing and yourself notify uh, other employees with whom the person has come in contact that there has been a positive test and that they sh themselves uh, should be tested. And until they get tested, that they're going to need to to be on um, on quarantine. Um, there's there's all kinds of different leave that's available both um, both at federal level and uh, local level now for um, individuals who need to be on quarantine or need to take leave for COVID related reasons and in our experience most most employers are also being very flexible with either paid leave or unpaid leave in these particular situations as well before that person returns um, we strongly suggest that you receive some kind of work return to work certificate indicating that um, from a from a um, healthcare provider indicating that that person is, uh, is, is healthy enough to return to the workplace. Um, obviously, closing down the workplace, if necessary, doing a deep cleanse may or may not be, um, may or may not be required. It depends on your location, the size of the office, where that particular individual uh, has um, has uh, has gone in the office, what what surfaces they've touched, how how much they've roamed, uh, we've had uh, everything from uh, uh, clients who have shut down their office to get a deep cleanse, and then uh, returned workers after a period of 48 hours, which is typically what it takes, to um, other businesses that quarantine off particular areas. Of the office where the uh, employee who tested positive has been and those particular areas get uh, a deep cleanse and are quarantined off so uh, coming up with the written policies and procedures for this well in advance of something happening if it hasn't already happened in your workplace is going to be very important So I know we're, we're coming up on our hour time and we still have a lot to talk about so if those of you who are willing and able to stay with us, um, we, we would like to share this information with you. And of course, if you are have to drop off and have any questions on our slides, we are always here and available for you. Um, so talking about implementing and enforcing just really quickly, um, as I mentioned, making sure those pre-return communications are in place so people know before they show up um, exactly what's going to be expected of them. Um, looking to update your written policies, if you have any written policies that either contradict the new normal um, or if you want to issue new written policies, great to have something for employees to refer back to um, rather than having an all-team Zoom call and then, um, you know, people having questions later, having something for them to look at. Um, 
obviously making sure that as with any other policy, your supervisors and managers are both overseeing um, the enforcement of these policies and setting good examples. Um, potentially depending on the size of your workforce, thinking about an employee reporting system um, for other employees who are perhaps taking a smoke break and taking their masks down and standing close to each other um, or who are you know, misusing, um, misusing the PPE or who are not using PPE. Um, it may be a sensitive topic for an employee to feel like they are going to be approaching another employee about it. So whether it's confidential or in um, conjunction with HR, having a way for employees to be able to bring um, that in a more confidential, not necessarily guaranteed confidential um, way to, to the business's attention so it can be addressed. Um, and then making sure employees understand, as I said, that these are legitimate business policies and the consequences will be um, the same so that there may be um, termination, there may be written notices um, if employees do not follow these new COVID-19 policies that are being put in place. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. And this harkens back to what I said right at the outset, which is a tremendous anxiety about returning to the workplace and uh, this is one of the most popular questions we get, which is what about employees who can't or don't want to return to work? And this is going to take uh, a fair amount of you know, effort on our part as employers to try to deal with these particular situations. Here we've kind of outlined in a, in a broad, a, a broad um, sense the, 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 the steps that is identifying the reason that the employee doesn't want to return. And... Um, you know, uh, the, some of those are identified on the next slide, which is, um, is it because of uh, health risk? Is the employee, him or herself, at a health risk? Do they live with someone who's at a high risk? Um, do they have caregiving responsibilities um, for either um, elder care or child care uh, because school's not in session anymore or something like that? Um, are there financial reasons? Um, that you can see the employee may be making more on unemployment than they would if they wanted to return to their job, or is the employee just personally not at high risk and, and scared about returning to work? All of these different buckets are going to require a different response. Um, for individuals that have health risks, there could be pregnancy issues, there could be uh, sufficient mental health issues around, around anxiety, there could be concerns about the, the safety protocols that the employer has put in place. Maybe they have high uh, at-risk um, uh, uh, people living with them in their own household. So assessing the reason or identifying the reason is gonna be a critical first step because once you identify the reason, then you can deal with the questions about, is there a legal issue here or is this just a practical issue? Are there some legal analysis I'm gonna have to do or am I just going to assess our own uh, uh, companies approaching culture to these particular issues. Um, there are obviously uh, many uh, 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 paid sick leave laws that are that could come into play. There's FMLA that can come into play. There's ADA that can come into play. So when someone identifies it as a health risk um, or a caregiving responsibility, those are the types of things where you need to start to do the legal analysis, and we'll go in a little bit more detail on those in a second. Um, on the other hand, if it's just a personal uh, concern about returning to the workplace, then you have to decide what is our culture going to be around this? Are we going to come up with separate leave buckets that we didn't have before that we may want to make available to employees to be more generous with unpaid leave, for example? Um, to allow employees to advance leave, uh, to allow employees to borrow leave, to allow our employees to continue to telecommunicate, or tele, tele, um, commute. Um, maybe we got to work with this particular employee and bring that employee maybe in a later return to work phase. If you're, if you're dividing um, your return to work in different phases. Maybe we can put that employee down the road a little bit um, after the employee can see actually what we are doing in our work workplace to make them feel safe and comfortable. Maybe that's someone that we bring back to work one day a week 
and build a level of confidence and trust with that employee that as the employer, we are doing everything we can and we are going to create a safe and healthy work environment. So there, there, again, there's a lot of issues to work through here, but our advice is, you know, ask the right questions so that you can decide. Are these legal issues and we're going to have to step through leave and accommodation laws or are these personal preference issues? Jess? You can go to the next slide, Kristen. So over the next two slides, um, we've covered a lot of, of this already as far as the types of communications you're going to want to have with employees who are returning um, to work as far as the safety protocols that are going to be in place. Um, as far as what special provisions there are going to be for people who are in different categories of concern or inability to return to work. Um, just going to flag a, a few of them as far as that we haven't touched on yet. Um, describing a company's policy on travel in light of COVID-19, um, that sort of comes into two buckets. First, the, the company's policy um, both on travel outside the workplace for business purposes. So I saw a question come in from somebody who said, what about employees who have to go to client sites typically in the nature of their job, um, making sure employees understand that if business travel was a part of their work, um, how that is going to be impacted, whether it's local travel um, to other client sites or vendor venues, um, or whether it is broader national or international travel and what impact that is going to have on their ability to do their job. Um, whether they're going to have any other additional job requirements added to their pot while they are unable to perhaps travel internationally or nationally, um, making sure people understand that. And then as um, different uh, countries and states slowly start to reopen it, open, having employees understand the consequences of whether um, there are going to be notice requirements um, and potential quarantine periods if they decide to voluntarily, whether for you know, personal enjoyment, to visit a family member, um, to go to some of these areas. Um, we faced this question early on um, when certain economies were closing and seeing hot spots before um, the U.S. really took as serious an approach to COVID-19. So it's sort of going to be the reverse of that. You know, are you going to be telling employees who, you know, if certain countries we saw just the other day that Iceland is going to start um, opening to tourists this summer? Um, are you going to tell employees who have been to Iceland or who've been on a plane in general um, that they have to self-quarantine for 14 days? And what type of leave requirements or leave options are those employees going to have? And making sure that they understand in advance um, what the consequence will be um, if they decide to um, leave the country, leave the state, do anything involving an airplane, whatever parameters you want to set. Next slide, Kristen. Um, this, again, really goes through a lot of what we already talked about. So in the interest of time, um, I will leave it to, to everybody as far as really, again, just making sure the communication, um, particularly in this time with employees being nervous and uncomfortable and uh, it being sort of uncharted waters, the more communication, the more clarity you can provide people, the better. Back to you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Why don't we go to the next slide? Um, uh, one of the questions that came in a second ago, which I'll touch on real quick before hitting these exact leave considerations is um, a workplace that has everybody telecommuting and, and reopens and uh, one of the employees doesn't want to return to the office and would prefer to continue telecommuting, do you have to accommodate that? The short answer is no, unless the situation falls into a reasonable, uh, an ADA um, uh, issue uh, if the person has uh, a condition that uh, impacts their ability to do the essential functions of their job and they have a recognized disability, then you are going to have to consider whether or not telecommuting is a reasonable accommodation. And that's going to be a fascinating issue for us to deal with as employers because the courts have largely sided with employers that telecommuting is not a reasonable accommodation in most circumstances based on the employer's uh, convincing arguments that, um, that workers work more optimally in the workplace. That all may be subject to question as we may move forward. Um, I can certainly see 
that uh, employees who are seeking a reasonable accommodation for telecommuting may be able to develop much better arguments now than they were able to develop three months ago. So that's going to be fascinating to see how that how they how that develops and how the courts grapple with it and how the courts grapple with the idea that telecommuting is either optimal or suboptimal way to get work done. But turning to to the question of uh, before, if you have someone that doesn't want to return or can't return to work, putting it, uh, deciding whether it's legal or personal preference. If it's legal, you're going to have to consider a variety of uh, federal, state, and local laws. You know, we all deal with the FMLA. Uh, is is the accommodation or what the person is seeking? Is it a health issue that's covered by the FMLA? Of course, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, you have both the emergency family medical leave for uh, workers that may have school-aged children where the school or the health or the child care is closed um, and they get certain uh, rights to take leave under that statute. Then of course you have the paid sick leave under the same, the same statute, uh, the 80 hours of paid sick leave for a variety of uh, COVID related reasons uh, so you'll have to consider whether that's available whether they've used it haven't used it they haven't used it does it apply of course in maryland and dc we have a variety of other local and uh laws that we have to deal with you have the uh, montgomery county paid sick leave law you have the, the state of maryland paid sick leave law you have dc um paid leave which is kicking in this july uh, officially you also have DC, which has passed its own um, version of the Families First Coronavirus Response Paid Sick Leave Act and amended their own FMLA. So um, DC has its own coronavirus related leave laws that you'll have to navigate. So it's going to be a bit of a minefield um, when the question is, does this person have a legal reason for uh, for needing leave or for not coming into the workplace and working through all of those pieces of uh, of law to get to the right answer, but they will all come into play. So you'll first identify the jurisdiction. Where is this employee? Is the employee in Maryland or DC or Virginia or some other state? Um, and then you'll start to walk through both the local, state, and federal uh, leave laws or accommodation laws that may apply. The next slide. There you go. Yeah, and uh, and hopefully you all know by now that uh, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, there is a posting requirement. Again, this goes on your on your board um, uh, in a common space, or uh, uh, the, the the law says that it can also be emailed or or sent by direct mail to the uh, to the employees. Um, at this at this stage, there's no requirement that it be posted in other languages, but it is available in Spanish, I believe, at this point. Um, so I'll hit that quickly. Thanks, Jess. Yep. So reasonable accommodation. We've already talked through most of that already. Again, flagging that um, state, local, and federal law um, employees ge employers generally have an obligation to reasonably accommodate an employee's employee with a disability. Um, provided that doing so will allow the employee to do the essential functions of their job um, and won't pose an undue hardship to the employer. Um, for those of you that have had these conversations with us before, you know that the undue hardship threshold um, is quite high. So inconvenience does not equal undue hardship. So if you do have employees who, um, because of high risk factors, perhaps can't come into the office um, or are dealing with other issues, certainly want to make sure that you're stepping back and handling these like you would any other request for an accommodation. Um, and again, as I flagged before, making sure that you remember that mental health issues are protected disabilities. Um, we're seeing the data that the added stress and isolation of COVID-19 is certainly um, exacerbating some of these mental health issues. So that may become a bigger issue for employers um, as employees come back into the workplace. Next slide, please. Um, on compensation and employee benefits, just a few things to remember, too, when you're bringing people back, particularly if you're bringing them back in a bit of a different situation or scenario than they were in before um, they may have gone out on a furlough or on a telecommuting policy. 
Um, making sure that you're, you haven't jeopardized an employee's FLSA exempt versus non-exempt classification. Um, as you know, from those of you who participated in prior webinars and discussions with us over the exempt versus non-exempt classification, that in and of itself can take an entire webinar. Um, but in order for an employee to be exempt from federal and state um, overtime laws, basically they need to be paid a guaranteed salary and have certain requisite duties. Um, obviously, if you converted an employee to an hourly employee um, or reduced their salary below that required salary threshold of $684 a week, that employee is no longer going to qualify as an exempt employee and will need to be eligible to accrue um, and be paid overtime. Similarly, if you've had other reductions in force um, that have occurred or changes in job duties, um, making sure that the duties prong of the exemption test is still met. Um, for example, if you had someone who previously qualified for the executive exemption uh, because they supervised two people and had sufficient hire fire authority, um, and now with reductions in force, they're only supervising one person, um, that may jeopardize their exemption. So you need to actually go back and make sure that anyone who's had a change in circumstance and is, was previously classified as exempt is still going to be exempt. Uh, talking about compensation for time spent on COVID-19 related measures um, gets into the wage and hour question. Um, from a federal standpoint, the rules are fairly lax as far as um, whether employers are required to, for example, um, the most recent Supreme Court case dealt with um, whether employers are required, uh, Amazon in particular, was required to pay employees for the time spent going through a security checkpoint when they left, which made sure that employees were not stealing items. Um, the court held that that was not, that did not need to be treated as compensable time for the employee. Um, these are often known also as the donning and doffing rules. So um, from back in the day when people would be putting on and off uniforms or protective equipment, are they getting paid for that time? Um, it's gonna pose similar questions if you are, for example, asking employees to line up and have their temperature taken at the door. Uh, before they're able to come in and clock into their work, um, making sure that it's clear and making sure that you're monitoring because depending on what jurisdiction you're in and what the situation is, um, it, you may be required to pay employees. Uh, the three jurisdictions around us here um, tend to be more restrictive um, than the federal government when it comes to what is and is not compensable time. So making sure that you're assessing these extra requirements you're putting in place for employees and making sure you're determining whether they do or do not need to be paid. Um, on benefits eligibility, again, this ties into the idea of if you've had a change in the situation for an employee, making sure you're paying attention to whether this is gonna impact their benefits at all. Um, for those employees who were furloughed, hopefully you've already had the conversation with your health insurance provider um, about whether that employee needed to be placed on COBRA or could stay on your health insurance plan for a limited duration. Um, we have heard the number of health insurance providers are allowing employees to stay on for two or three months while this is going on um, without them having to be um, converted over to COBRA because they are not working the requisite hours that would normally be required to qualify for the plan. Um, if you're bringing people back and they're going to be at reduced hours um, or they're going to be converted from exempt to non-exempt, you want to be having a similar analysis as to whether they still qualify for health insurance, whether they still qualify for 401k, whether they still qualify for certain types of leave accrual policies you may have in place, um, and having that convenient that conversation with employees um, about how that is going to work. And then finally, of course, when it comes to modifying things with employees, just remembering any agreements or contractual obligations you have with employees and looking at whether um, it is going to be necessary to do amendments to contracts or if there's going to be any contracts or agreements in place um, that would bind you in a way that would not permit you the maximum flexibility in bringing people back as far as perhaps their hours or their compensation is involved. Back to you, Jim. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jess. So um, hit these last two slides. I'm not going to go into a, a, a lot of the slides because there's another attachment, as I'll, as I'll indicate. But um, even if operations have resumed in some form or fashion, uh, as we've been talking about, and all are part of the workforce, it's likely will continue to telecommute for the foreseeable future. Uh, for many of our clients, employers, the COVID crisis hit so fast that they didn't have time to review their handbooks or other policies to consider whether they covered the myriad issues that arise with a large 
remote workforce, and in particular, many employers did not even have a telecommuting policy. Um, it's never too late to put one in place. So we have in included as the uh, second handout a sample telecommuting, telecommuting policy that hits uh, all of the major issues. And uh, we think it's very important that you put one in place. Um, maybe some things that you wouldn't normally think about in particular that I, that I think are very important in any telecommuting policy are the IT issues and the issues surrounding the, the continued uh, protection of confidential company information now that someone is going to be really aggregating and collecting that possibly in their home office or on their home computers, um, on their personal devices, more than they would have even before. Uh, so those are some very important things to think about. They are all addressed in the sample telecommuting policy that we've um, included. And I would certainly encourage you to look through that and to put a telecommuting policy in place um, immediately if you haven't already done so. So I believe that, go ahead, Jess, if you want to wrap it up, and then we have a few questions we can try to take if, um, if people are willing to stay on the line. Yeah, so taking it to our final slide, please, Kristen. Uh, so here, just a few additional uh, considerations that don't fall into sort of any natural basket we've already talked about. Uh, the practical and the existential, I'll leave those to you. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the two I wanted to flag, one which ties into um, some of the questions we've already received. Uh, first, on the financial side, thinking about the decisions you're making and how they will impact your PPP loan um, if you have one. Um, we actually, I would flag for anyone who did not see our alert that went out yesterday morning, um, we do have more new information um, as of last Friday about the PPP loan forgiveness. Um, that came out in the form of the PPP loan forgiveness application that came along with about 10 pages worth of instructions and worksheets. Um, we're we expect that there may be some changes to that document before it becomes final because there's still a number, a couple weeks before any of the, the PPP loans are gonna be getting to the end of their eight week periods. Um, however, we do know some important things that answer some of the questions we're getting. Um, one of which is if you are bringing someone back, if you're offering to bring them back to work and they decline, that will not impact your PPP loan forgiveness amount. Um, similarly, if they um, resign while they're at work or you terminate them for cause while they're at work, um, that won't impact your PPP loan forgiveness amount. Um, as far as the people who you're offering to bring back, um, and bring back to work and they decline, you want to make sure that offer to bring them back is in writing because that will be something that you need to include in the documentation with the loan forgiveness application. So to the extent that you're planning out bringing people back, making sure those return to work notices are in writing um, so that you have that documentation that you offered for someone to come back and they decline to do so for the purposes of your PPP loan will be important. Um, on the legal side, just two quick issues. Um, that may be, you know, costly issues. Uh, business liability, I would flag, there has been a lot of talk on the Hill about whether um, Congress will pass or look to pass a, a business liability shield, essentially a safe, safe harbor for any businesses that reopen in accordance with state and local um, and federal guidance and perhaps follow either CDC or OSHA instructions um, to reopen whether those businesses would be able to avoid liability um, from a suit from a visitor or employee in the workplace who then contracts COVID-19 despite the business following the recommended procedures. Um, frankly, the pushback we've been seeing, um, we do not expect uh, such legislation to pass. So that's just something for employers to be aware of um, and to perhaps talk to their insurance brokers about, about the types of protection and types of insurance they have available um, in the event that they do see claims for someone who's infected in their office. Uh, as Jim mentioned, also on the legal side, um, discrimination claims, making sure that decisions that are being made about bringing employees back to work um, are being made in a neutral fashion um, and are being made based on the information and communications with the employee. 
Um, I emphasize that because we recently saw the EOC has been doing a nice set of Q&As, um, and they reminded employers that, you know, just because you have an employee that you believe is high risk, so maybe you know they have a disability, or maybe they're of advanced age, and um, given what we know about COVID-19, they may be higher risk. Um, if that employee has not expressed to you that they need an accommodation or they don't want to come back into the workplace, you should not be using those factors to make the decision about whether you bring them back. So the idea of bringing back all your employees under 40 and leaving everybody else on furlough um, will certainly leave you in hot water when it comes to discrimination claims. So making sure you're using a very neutral approach um, and only um, only dealing with those issues or only having those issues about an at-risk employee come up if the employee themselves is the one who raises them. So with that, I think we'll turn to some questions, Jim, if we have some time. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Uh, I hope this was helpful for everyone. Uh, some of this is obviously common sense. Some of it is stuff we've, we're hearing and being bombarded with in uh, the news every single day. And, um, you know, some of it is stuff that, that, that is based on questions that we're getting and fielding on a daily basis to try to help navigate these issues for, for you all. Some involves legal issues. And as I said, some is just uh, kind of some common sense stuff. Uh, I think we've answered most of the questions along the way, but certainly if there's any other questions, we'll uh, stay on the line for another five minutes and, and field those. Um, again, we thank you very much for participating. We, um, we enjoy this. It's uh, hopefully useful and helpful. And if nothing else gets the juices flowing uh, to, to think about the myriad of issues that need to be dealt with as we all try to get our employees back in our offices as much as possible. Uh, but certainly gives us the opportunity to think about new ways of doing business, whether it's necessary to have everyone back in the office, uh, whether that's more efficient. Uh, maybe as a business, we can look to reduce our space um, and our rent as we move forward, looking to more of a telecommuting model. And what does that look like for us? So um, some very interesting times, obviously raising very interesting, complex issues that we're all dealing with. And, um, and we, th we thank you for attending this afternoon. It looks like we do have a few, a few quick questions coming in um, that we can um, get to for those who wanna stay on the line. Um, one great question, should, we, should these COVID style policies become part of our handbook or would we prefer that they be separate? Um, at this point, you know, I work with a lot of you on your handbook, um, obviously checking in on your handbook to see if there's anything that would be needing to be updated long term, um, since it's going to be quite a matter of adapting and monitoring the situation. I wouldn't necessarily say um, that you want to, to put all of these policies built in and baked into your handbook right away. Um, it may be easier and um, more straightforward to do them as an amendment or short-term policies um, to your handbook before you integrate them, just so you can sort of give them a little bit of a test before you take the time to actually put them into your handbook and formally roll them out, um, additionally recognizing the fact that they may be short-term and you may not want to have to re-amend your handbook later down the line. You may prefer simply to withdraw um, the short-term policies. Um, for those of you who are asking questions about your PPP loan forgiveness, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are happy to discuss that offline, but those, those are going to get into another 30-minute discussion, so it will be easiest for us if you just reach out to us and we can, we can chat about any of those offline. We had one final question. It looks like, for those of you still on the line, uh, what if an employee uh, cites the workplace as the location where they contracted uh, COVID despite the employer's best efforts. Um, I think there's there's two issues lurking there, it seems to me. One is legal, the other is practical. Uh, legally, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to see with the meat, pack, meat packing plants and some of the large larger manufacturing facilities that have been um, hot spots um, for uh, for the spread of COVID, we're seeing some lawsuits, starting to see some lawsuits. 
a uh, little too early to tell exactly how those are going to turn out, but I think at least from the news, it appears that most of those were not places where they were uh, engaging uh, or using best practices at the time. Um, I think as those of you on the call return your workforces to the workplace, you're going to be using best practices. And um, obviously OSHA has a general duty clause that, um, that requires employers to have uh, a safe workplace, generally speaking. I don't think that uh, an employer who uses the best efforts is going to be liable under that general duty clause in any way to OSHA or otherwise. Um, uh, if someone is technically injured because they've contracted the virus at, um, in the workplace, there may be uh, obviously workers' compensation issues that come up and arise out of that. I think that as a general matter, if you're following best practices, your legal risk is going to be low at this point uh, if someone does co contract it in the workplace. But obviously, if they do, you're going to have to go, going back to some of our earlier slides, you're going to have to do a lot of work as far as disinfecting, contact tracing, um, notifying uh, coworkers, uh, notifying visitors, et cetera, and dealing with the fact that you may have a spread in, in your work location. So with that, it looks like the questions have uh, uh, the questions have largely ceased. So um, we're going to cut it off at this time. And again, uh, on behalf of uh, Jesse and I, uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, we hope that this has been useful for you. Have a great afternoon. Bye. -bye. Thank you.